that I got an email who's from Jonathan. He said, we'd love you to come to Garrison, but not to talk about buildings. He said, I want you to talk about wisdom. I, so my first impulse was to say, sorry, I, <laughs> I don't have any wisdom. I'm, I, you want to talk about buildings? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I can, talk, I, can bore, I can bore all of you for the rest of the day. So uh, I thought about it. And um, I thought about wisdom. I thought, what is, it, what is it this all about? And where does it come from? And for me, uh, this is not exactly the view that I had growing up. But I grew up about 50 miles north of here in the middle of an apple orchard in a little town called Red Hook, New York, which at that point was just a traffic light. And we, uh, we got milk in milk bottles. It was left on the back porch. And we returned the milk bottles, and they washed them out and reused them. We, uh, we had a clothesline where we dried our clothes. And we didn't have a clothes dryer. We had no TV. When I say that, people look at me and say, what did you do? <laughs> what did you do without TV? Well, we talked a lot, actually. We listened to the radio. Radio is fantastic because you can see it in your head. But it's yours. It's nobody else's. It's in your head. Um, but we had no TV. And you get to read a lot um, because there's no TV, uh, especially in the winter. And uh, we didn't have a lot of things that people take for granted today, like bottled water. One of the dumbest things we could possibly be doing. But we, we didn't have bottled water. And we didn't have anything in plastic packages. When you went to the hardware store, rather than buying a piece of plastic that you, that you almost need a pair of, of tin shears to open, all the screws and nuts and bolts and anything you wanted to buy was right there. And you could just take it out of a little compartment and go to the cash register and pay. So there was no plastic stuff. Um, and we learned from, from our elders. We had a lot of, I had a lot of time to talk to them. And I just wanted to, uh, I wrote down some of the things that I learned from elders. You can't coast uphill. <laughs> My grandfather told me that. Actually, when I, was, when I had graduated from college, and he said, you're going to have to work hard. You can't coast uphill. He was right. Uh, another is, if you love your work, you'll never work a day in your life. And I found that to be true. I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I love my work. Uh, pushing on a rope. How many of us have been literally trying to push on a rope and it just doesn't work? And this, I'm sure you've all heard this. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. But these little, these things that we hear from our elders, um, actually have an awful lot of meaning if we start stop to think about them. Uh, and in prep for this, I, I have two uh, fantastic partners, one named Rick Cook and one named uh, Bill Browning. And I said, um, got any thoughts about this? And Bill Browning, who is part Mohawk, and is Dennis? Where's Dennis? I don't see Dennis. You, you are part Native American, Bill told me. Right. So if I say something wrong, Please correct me, because uh, this is not my area of expertise. <laughs> so, uh, so they said, well, what you're really talking about is multi-generational thinking. And there's probably no better group to look at than the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee is... Um, is a, the word Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse. You will probably know, know this group of Native, American, Native Americans better because they were called the Iroquois. The Iroquois is not a nice word in their language. Algonquin, it means black snakes, and that was not good. But most people think of them as the, as the <coughs> Iroquois. And there were five tribes. Uh, going from east to west, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. 
um, and they were in a line. This is actually fairly symbolic, and right in the middle is the Onondaga, and the Onondaga were the keepers of the council fire. And they were, they were fighting all these tribes, and there were the Hurons were to the north um, in what is now Canada, and they were the really bad guys, and so they were mainly fighting the Hurons, but they were fighting each other. And one of them, whose name is the Peacekeeper, there are those who think it's Hiawatha, but the Peacekeeper, spent 40 or 50 years walking around. If you've ever driven from Lake Seneca and one of the Finger Lakes over to Albany, you've driven in a car, it's a long way. These guys were walking. There was no, no cars. We're talking about 1142. And um, one of them, the peacekeeper, said, you know, there's this a better way. You know, there's a better way. We could, we could band together. We could have the Mohawks who were on the east, and there's a lot of bad people in the east. They can be the gatekeepers. They can, they can warn us when there's, when there's bad people coming, and they can fight. Um, but we could all get together and talk about being a peaceful nation. So... They did. It, it took them a long time to get pull this together. And they actually constructed their buildings in a way that was similar to the way the tribes were laid out. Now you might be able to see this. This is a Rick Cook sketch that he did probably four years ago to prepare for a presentation. But what it shows is actually, for those of you who are building housing, it shows, uh, uh, it shows a double loaded corridor down the middle. Interesting scheme. And in the middle of this, this drawing on the right is half of the plan, really. In the middle was the fire that was kept going all the time. And each one of these little rectangles that you can see on the top and the bottom was for another clan. And each clan had its space. And the east side was fixed. And as, they, as more clans were added, they built them longer. So it was a very adaptable housing form. It was a matriarchal society. Um, some lesson that we are, we're, we're, we're learning. <laughs> we're, we're getting there. Uh, but the women chose the chiefs. And the chiefs were sent to the council fire um, in, uh, uh, at, in, in the middle of this nation. The, women, the chiefs were sent to the, uh, to the council fire to meet with each other. And the, the, it was all about agreement that the Mohawks and the Oneidas would, would come up with a plan. It was their job to initiate some of the thinking. And then the others would look at it. And if they agreed, they would, they would all vote and say yes. If they didn't agree, they'd discuss it. But the whole idea was to come up with agreement. If the chiefs were not doing a good job, the women said, you're out of here. And they got somebody else. So there was a lot of pressure on these chiefs to do well. Um, this is what their structures looked like. Uh, again, this is a sketch, a Rick sketch. They were, they were really twigs covered with, with skins, but they were, um, as you can see, you could add to this uh, very easily. But it was really a communal living. Uh, as I said, matriarchal. If, uh, if you, you could not marry in your clan, so if you were, if you were, uh, if you got married, uh, when you got married, you would, you could either move to another tribe. And uh, uh, to the, you could, if you were a Cayuga, you could go to the Senecas, and uh, you would join uh, the, the clan of your, uh, of your uh, wife. So that great wisdom led to this, that you, I'm, I got to think that everybody in this room has seen this. But that's not all they were talking about. That's not the whole thing. Because we all, we've, we've heard this, I don't think any of us, including me, really every decision that I make has to do with seven generations down the line. And they understood that because this is the whole thing. It even requires having skin as thick as the bark of a pine. The reason it was the bark of a pine is that when they had fires, the pine trees lasted. The fire did not go through the bark of the pine. So they knew it was tough. <laughs> they, they knew this wasn't going to be easy. But that was the basis on which they made all of these decisions. It's interesting that these people came together at this in, a long time ago when in, in Europe, where most of the people in this room have our origins, 
is, in, is somewhere in Europe. We were still fighting and killing and having great battles all over the place. Uh, Henry, uh, Henry I was the king of England, um, uh, 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 Louis VI was the king of France, and there was, they, they were fighting each other all over the place. And there was no great thinking as to how, one, how groups might get together and cooperate. And in fact, there are many who believe that this, uh, the great law of these people uh, was the basis for our Constitution. So, uh, and one of the things that these people understood was that monocultures are bad. So in the, when they planted things, they planted, this is called the three sisters method. There was a corn, which was the tall pretty sister, and bean, which, uh, which needed something to grow on. Beans needed some structure. So that was the little sister who was kind of holding the hand of the, of the, of the tall pretty sister. And, but the beans would put nitrogen back. The nitrogen the corn was taking out of the soil, the beans would put back into the soil. And then there was squash, which had broad leaves, which would actually help to keep the soil moist and conditioned. And uh, so these, it is this, this multicultural system, this diversity of, of planting that allowed these people to flourish. In fact, it wasn't only one kind of corn. There were a whole bunch of different kinds of corn. And if we look back at, at the monocultures that we have experienced, think of the Irish potato famine. The Irish potato was, uh, came from somewhere in South America, and it was a monoculture. <laughs> it was a monoculture, but it was a, it was a big potato. They, they grew fast, they grew well, they tasted good, and then they had a blight, and the entire country, as, as those of you who have done a little history on this, wiped out wiped out the entire potato crop because it was a monoculture. And if we look a little closer to home, we have monocultures, we've had monocultures here. A city called Poughkeepsie it was a monoculture with a company called IBM. Another city called Kingston was a monoculture with IBM. A city called Syracuse, monoculture with carrier air conditioning. If you go to these cities now, Kingston, Poughkeepsie, Syracuse, they are, they're devastated. They had a monoculture. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that there are people who are really focused on these, on <coughs> maintaining uh, diversity. Um, this is a book written by Eric Shivian and Ari uh, Bernstein um, about sustaining life in, in terms of the biological world. And what they found is that there are species going extinct that have, that have had incredible medicinal value, and they're now lost forever. So as we, as more, and, 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 I, and we've, we're more and more species are becoming extinct every minute, because we're not, we're not under, we don't understand the wealth of this uh, diversity. Um, so that, that wisdom is being lost. This, this is, um, so next is an image of a book. I have not read it, but Bill Browning said, you have to read this book. It talks about language, and we are losing cultures and language as rapidly as we are losing our species. And the diversity, this, this multicultural piece of our, of, of our species is, is being lost forever. And um, I've actually, I've ordered the book. I haven't, I haven't uh, read it, um, but it is... Um, uh, but according to Bill, this is a phenomenal book. And as we lose our history, as we lose our, the wisdom of our elders, as we lose these languages all over the world, uh, it's really going to be a mess. Um, in 2008, uh, I was at Greenbuild in Boston, and uh, there, was a, there was a fantastic panel uh, led by a man named Kevin Close, who at that point was the president of NPR, and two biologists, one named Janine Benyus, who represented the, the perhaps current generation, and Ed Wilson, who represented a, a more senior generation. 
And they were talking about um, biomimicry and biophilia. And that was the whole piece of this. And it was meant to be a sort of a fireside chat kind of thing. And Kevin Close being an incredible moderator. And in fact, I mentioned to John that uh, he, would be a, he would be really worthwhile having at Garrison. He's a phenomenal speaker. So they're talking about stuff. And, and uh, so, and, and to set the context of this, this is 2008. And two institutions in New York City that we all knew would be there forever, one called Bear Stearns, uh, went away in the spring, and Lehman Brothers went away right before this conference. So the world was, was the financial world was, was shattered. And so Kevin says to, to Ed Wilson, well, what do you think, you know, what, are we, what can we look at in the future? Here they're talking about biomimicry and, and biophilia, and this is what Ed Wilson said, more or less. I'm not sure if I have the quote exactly right. But redefining uh, success as not the quantity of stuff, but the quality of life. And if, and if there was wisdom to be had, that was it. And this, I'm sure you've all seen this, but I... So I wanted to have that up there while I read something that I thought was appropriate, perhaps for this discussion, but more for what I think Garrison is all about and what one can learn here. And I'm, I'm going to read it, forgive me. The hardest part of the great law, this goes back to the Haudenosaunee, is to understand the meaning of the concept of peace. Peace is not simply the absence of war. In the Iroquoian mind, peace is a state of mind. Each individual has a base spiritual power. As you go through life as Haudenosaunee, experience different things, learn more, comprehend more, and tap into other forms of spiritual power, your own spirit grows as well. The old timers called it orenda. Everyone is thought to have it to some degree. It affects how we do things. Good minds have strong orenda. So the ultimate power of the great law rests in how well the individual person develops their sense of self in regards to the well-being of others in the clan, in the village, in the nation, and in the confederacy of the six nations. <coughs> so I thought that would be an appropriate spot to end. Thank you. <laughs>